record? Yes, okay, so there we go. Um, so now uh, it's my uh, privilege to um, introduce Marcos Major of Climate Action Now, who's gonna talk with us about sidewalk gardening. And um, so it's all yours. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all, you Southern Californians. Hello from the great North or Central North of San Francisco. My name is Marcos Major. I am director of Climate Action Now. And we, I started Climate Action Now in 2010, as I was uh, previously speaking with Brent. Um, we uh, have now been around 11 years and it's been quite a joy really to be self-employed, although I certainly was not doing all of uh, being fully sustainable in the early years. Um, I am fully employed, <laughs> self-employed now. And um, I guess just some ground rules. Uh, you know, I'm happy to take questions in the chat as we go along. Um, I do teach on Zoom, so feel free to jump in there and um, ask some questions as we move. I know this talk, um, there was some intentionality around it being um, sidewalk landscaping. And so I will definitely delve into that, give you a little history about our organization and some of our uh, radical ideas that are taking shape here in San Francisco. So um, as I said, um, I started CAN in 2010. Before that, I had worked for various city agencies uh, throughout SF, and including the San Francisco Zoo, uh, the school district at various school sites from kinder to high school, um, Public Works Department, Bureau of Urban Forestry, the SF Botanical Garden, and the Department of Environment. And so kind of learning all these different ways that city agencies work well and work not as well and what they can do and their capacity limitations as well. You know, I kind of came up with some of our ideas that has driven forward our organization. Um, and without that further ado, I'll go into a PowerPoint and share some fun photos and some of our experience. And so, here we go. Now I did do um, Al Gore's training and he did the same thing where he, he opened his computer and he shared all this mess on his, uh, on his desktop and the whole audience gasped and was shocked at how messy his computer was. So I'm following Al's lead here. Um, I'm wondering if this can be moved. Yes, there we go. Yoink. Huh. Remove control, remote control. So I'm gonna put this down here. If anybody knows how to get rid of this, feel free to tell me. Thank you, there we go. So our mission is to cultivate green infrastructure investments and meaningful green jobs throughout the state supporting ecological resilience through community-based programming and projects in California. Um, and I'm very happy to share with you today about native plants gardening. Of course, I had a little more hair back then. Um, and all these kids are now seniors in high school. <laughs> so we've been doing this work for quite a long time. And I'm really excited to share this with you all. Our organization, works to teach people about climate change through the process of urban habitat restoration. Here's some of our work from the first year at the Sunset Boulevard project, which I'll go into. Key to our investments in our work are public partnerships with the school district and with public works, the water department, department of the environment, Recology, which is our garbage corporation, uh, which is a private public partnership and other agencies within the city as well. Um, you know, we're planting plants, it's true, but as all of you know, as gardeners, really we are building soil <laughs> because although yes, even natives don't need that much nitrogen, um, 
building soil is key, especially in degraded urban areas. And the kind of work that we're doing, we're also, you know, getting some cap and trade money from the state. And so we have to work hard to actually ensure that these trees live so that they can grow and continue to capture carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. In that vein, we don't use petroleum products as much as possible. Uh, we never would put down black shade cloth, for instance. We use sheet mulching and mulch and other organic methods uh, to ensure soil health. And so our biggest partnership is, you know, in the yard life in the school district. I'm really excited to share with you some fun school district projects that we've been doing. And I invite all of you to think about ways that you could collaborate with your school districts um, in Southern California, Los Angeles and beyond. Uh, there's really so many ways to partner with the schools. They're not always an easy partnership. And so we actually began our partnership with sc public schools in the street through a different agency, through the Department of Public Works, who is in charge of the sidewalks. And so, uh, you know, every county is different. Um, and some, you know, schools are, both municipal uh, and state. So there's some agencies that are hybrids, but public works agencies are generally very localized. And so we had a good relationship with pu our public works. We continue to have a good relationship. And, you know, the sidewalk does meet the school. And so we've started a lot of doing projects um, adjacent to school properties in the sidewalk. And here we're planning some Artemisias. Uh, you know, we measure our success through the sex, success of the pollinator uh, health, as well as the student's success as well. You know, ensuring that the students are winning and, uh, and achieving high goals is important. But botanically and horticulturally, we measure the success on the count of the pollinators on site. We have uh, partnership with the planning department where we've, uh, we have temporary parks that are in the progress, in the process of becoming permanent parks. And we promote organics and agroecological agro principles in all of our gardens. This is one of, my, one of my favorite gardens over at Washington High School where this one is about 800 square feet. I wanna make it clear that our work, we are removing pavement. This was not an open you know, garden previously. Our work building green infrastructure, in this case, green infrastructure is a dirt patch, <laughs> which is capable of growing food, showcasing California native plants and other drought tolerant species that promote biodiversity and urban pollinator health and provide a situation um, for young people to engage directly with nature, which, um, you know, we live in such a beautiful place all over the state and uh, getting people outside and connecting with nature is very key to our pro programmatic goals. One of our most recent projects with the school district, albeit in the public right of way was planting street trees at um, APG and any middle school. This was carbon fund invested. Um, in San Francisco, we have a carbon fund that is a municipal um, program that uh, every time, let's say the mayor or the head of public works travels down to see you all in LA for a meeting or to Sacramento or wherever it is out of SFO, there's a tax that the city uh, and county uh, puts on itself and that goes into a pot of money called the SF Carbon Fund and those investments are for direct investments, direct green infrastructure development that promotes capture and storage of greenhouse gases and in this instance um, the storage is these lovely, excuse me, these lovely linothamnus. So I have to say um, Antonio and everybody over at the Catalina Islands, I'm very uh, excited to meet you all and look forward to hearing from you more and going to the June 5th event on Zoom. And, um, you know, we work a lot with uh, Channel Island botanical material. It's really um, resilient for us in the Bay Area. And I'm happy to go more into that. But in this site, we planted 
I think 20 Lino, 15 Linothamnus, which is the Catalina Ironwood, five Ceanothus Ray Hartman, and one Arbutus Marina, which is developed in San Francisco, but not a native. But the bumblebees do like it. And this was 900 square feet removal. Another one of our projects, you know, working with the K-5, the kinder to fifth graders is very valuable, increasing the nature play potential of a schoolyard. I mean, look at this before the garden. And then this is after a lot of permits and a lot of planning, we got to jackhammer out the uh, slightly asbestos laden uh, pavement, although not enough to be too hazardous, fortunately. Um, and then later created the riparian garden, which boasts um, salix, uh, juncus, uh, mugwort, among other natives as well, ribes. And again, I used Catalina ironwoods because they're so uh, resilient for our climate. And here it is after establishment. I do need to give you a photo of how it is currently because it is just going off. This is two years ago and now it's really doing well. The, the, the willow are really thriving. So we do see green infrastructure in a little bit of a different way. Uh, it is an infrastructure investment. And in this case at James Lick Middle School, which is built in 32, uh, you know, California is the largest producer of asbestos in the world. And unfortunately, especially back in those days, it was uh, included in quite a lot of the, so the uh, pavement horizons. And so James Lick, unfortunately, middle school did contain asbestos. So we it definitely increases the cost of removal. And at this site, it was 2,500 square feet removal of pavement, which was 14 inches deep. <laughs> so the pavement removal at James Lick was Herculean. And we went from pavement to paradise and it has uh, food gardens and uh, native gardens, a riparian garden, um, raised veggie beds. Although the soil is clean, we, we can grow food in the ground. We have a Black Lives Matter garden and a Garden of the Americas. And here it is last year. Again, I need another, another one for you. I'm realizing that if I'm sharing here, I can't see the chat. So let me pull this up and see. Um, it looks like there's no questions yet. Okay. And let me share with you all my name and information there. There we go. So um, we even have some bananas, which is kind of fun. I know it's not a big deal for you Southern California people, but it is very exciting for us. And imagine this was all pavement, it was year one. And these young people, this is uh, uh, again at James Lick, this is our vegetable garden. This is a school that's probably over 75% free and reduced lunch, um, which is a way to measure um, affluence, perhaps, if you will. And so we were really excited to do this project. At the time, it was my biggest project uh, and we raised about $300,000 to remove 3,600 square feet of pavement. Okay, now I'm gonna, here's the part where I got a challenge for you because also at James Lick, I have a dinosaur garden and I know this is a native plant talk. So I will ask you what, and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for a minute. What is the one, California native. Well, I guess there's two, three maybe. <laughs> Who are the three plants that we let hang out in the dinosaur garden that are California natives? Anybody want to guess? Wild mustard. Heck no. No angiosperms. No angiosperms allowed. <laughs> Some type of fern. Fern. Yes, we do have the sword fern, the California native sword fern in there. Um, I also have Horse some Australian tail. ferns. Don't tell the CNPS people. Just kidding. Uh, what else? Dudleya. Dudleya, flowering plant, no angiosperms. Mm. Ironwood. Now ironwood, she would be allowed to hang out a little bit because she really old, but it is, I mean, evolutionarily, it's a very old angiosperm, but it's still an angiosperm. Flowering plant, not allowed. Horsetail. So, sorry? Horsetail. Horse, okay, you got it. There's four then. We got Equisetum up in there. You're right. 
Yes, horse tails there. Dinosaur fat, I don't know that one, but I wish we did. Um, Seuss plant, Dr. Seuss plant, I don't know that one either. Y'all thinking so small, think tall. I had to get special permission. <laughs> it's because you live on the other side of the state. Yes, sequoias. Yes, exactly. So I have both the dawn, um, excuse me, I have a, a giant redwood. We have one of those and we have three um, Sempervirens. I also have the other Taxodium and other fun, you know, exotic ones, um, but those aren't California. <laughs> So I digress. We will move on to Sunset Boulevard now, moving from our school district property partnerships to our public works partnerships. And these uh, partnerships along Sunset Boulevard, now this ain't Los Angeles is Sunset Boulevard, although yours is lovely as well. Ours is in the outer Sunset District, which is District 4, um, which is adjacent to, of course, the ocean. It's a very sandy soil, so we can never add enough mulch. But this project has been really a joy um, and really expanded my capacity to, you know, perform larger restoration projects um, that first comes with an idea. You know, we planted trees. Yes, we've actually planted a thousand trees. 72% um, of them are native trees, California Floristic Province, um, of course, you know, working with a lot of the island stuff like the island oak here um, and other, you know, linothamnus ironwood as well, but California in the broader sense. But, you know, it all starts with an idea. We had two biodiversity hubs where, um, you know, the species list is a little more diverse than it ended up being because we actually went uh, with a native plant palette for the this biodiversity hub at Sunset Boulevard at Lawton. And um, let's see. And so it starts with an idea. And then that idea gets teased out into a, a design that educates the community about not only the uh, funder, of course, which is the California Climate Investments act which is a tax but people don't like that word so much so we talked about investment dollars and so you know we really do what's interesting about this project is that <laughs> it um is such a high profile visi high visibility area we wanted to make it as understandable as possible and so these trees are capturing and sequestering greenhouse gases it's just as simple as we can get. And we put it up there with Public Works um, staff from the Bureau of Urban Forestry. It was a super happy day to get that up. It was not without contentious uh, nextdoor.com, you know, scathing <laughs> posts, but um, we still have it up there two years later and it will be removed eventually and replaced with a monolingual Chinese banner of the same language. Here is some of the planting in a rainbow overhead. I mean, you can't get much better than this. The native plants planted here, we have a partnership with University of San Francisco. And here's our lovely friend, Bob Hall, who's with Native Plant Society Yerba Buena chapter. He's donated all these beautiful, um, super local Quercus agrifolia, our, one of our few native trees to SF. Um, they don't, thrive. I mean, they do okay out there. They prefer to be in the Bayview probably, <laughs> um, but they're doing all right. We're, we're making it work. It's exciting to put the oaks in the ground. And so, yeah, this partnership, you know, before we began our partnership with the Yerba Buena chapter, we had planted around 600 trees. And so our partnership with the Yerba Buena CNPS began about, oh, geez, a year and half ago and so it's really exciting we have a grant from cal fire cal relief from the california climate investments act and um the yerba buena volunteers uh raised funds of their own to develop what we're calling a, a pilot block pilot block of the master plan you know and this is the beginning of the plantings um 
that could be going along the entire 40 blocks of uh, the whole Sunset Boulevard. But I'll say it is not possible at this time because of infrastructure challenges, meaning there's not water quick coupler uh, setups there. And I'm happy to go into more details about that because obviously plants need water. And um, that is often a prohibitive factor in moving projects forward. So this particular block, however, does have water, which is recycled water from Golden Gate Park. And so we water the 70 native trees that we put here um, with Hetch Hetchy water uh, and uh, Native Plant Society volunteers water also with recycled water. You know, they include this Cupressus macrocarpa uh, from Monterey, um, Ceanothus, Toyon is my favorite, such a high, good performer um, for the boulevard. And it also does well under the drip line of the cypress. Um, you know, we could get out there and do all the digging ourselves, but <laughs> that's not what we're about. We're about engaging community in the process. And so this was one of our, my flyers from um, Valentine's Day for a tree planting. We have people come from all around um, the city to help and make we make a fun day out of it. Even if we're wearing masks in a COVID era, we, even when we had to wear two masks now, you know, people still showed up and it's just been such a joy, you know, personally during the pandemic, I will say it's also been an outlet for me, for my mental health and for those I believe who come as well, you know, it's really a very rewarding thing to do. Um, but especially in the time when in social isolation, it's nice to have something that brings us together safely outdoors and uh, is a very productive opportunity. It's been really positive. And so if y'all up here in the city in the next uh, couple months, I hope you'll come out and work with us. I'm happy to share this on the email uh, listserv. Our latest funding for Sunset Boulevard of another 75 trees is from the SF Community Challenge Grant. And we're also doing 15 sidewalk landscapes uh, because of that grant. So, you know, partnerships are huge. I won't go into that much more than that, but uh, I'm happy to talk more about those if people have interest. But here's what the meat and potatoes are that we're here for as we're talking about, you all wanna hear about sidewalk landscapes. And you know, it really is beyond the school district and um, kind of these big thoroughfare medians, you know, private property, this is where public engagement meets private properties. And we've performed over a hundred sidewalk landscapes, which um, is probably around 18, 15 to 18,000 square feet of pavement removal in San Francisco. Um, this is when one of our gardeners had a mustache and more hair. <laughs> this is in the Bayview. Um, so how does it work? You know, um, I'm happy to go into more details about this as well. Again, if there's any questions, you know, pavement removal is so important in urban areas. It reduces the heat island effect. It actually literally, literally provides uh, habitat um, for all these pollinators and creatures that we care about and opportunity for us to grow California native plants that support local insects and wildlife. And of course it has the capacity to capture and store carbon dioxide. And it's a community uh, builder, 100%. So here's a guy that should have his mask on, <laughs> but this pavement was clean. Um, and we are doing a tr street tree basin there. And if you can see down the line, there are sidewalk landscape uh, basin uh, pavement removal happening. So we mark it out and um, get that cement out of there. Here's a project we did in the Bayview that's actually a private community garden that's uh, run by this family. And we put in, uh, she wanted all natives. And so she got all natives for her garden. And this was year one, this was five years ago. I should take a photo and com compare it. But um, this was a really fun, she did the most pavement removal of um, anybody in this particular project. It was about almost 400 square feet. And so, you know, 
it goes from, you know, the Western side of the city is very paved over. Uh, and that is a challenge, you know, culturally, but it also, as we know, provides an opportunity. And so here's a young uh, family of homeowners who just bought the home and they did a small piece right there. I would have loved if they did more here or more there, but this is what they wanted. And so we're happy to work with people to do just what they want. Cause it's all about, you know, having something that they feel good about. And so we've done sidewalk landscapes in the Richmond district. And we're currently have funds again, as I said, from the community challenge grant to um, perform 15 sidewalk landscapes in the Sunset District. I will say it is by far the most challenging neighborhood I've ever worked in, in terms of sidewalk landscaping. <laughs> um, let me see, I see, there might be a question. Uh, who maintains the gardens? Okay, well, that's, I'll tell you, one of the greatest things about working with uh, private gardens like these is that we don't have to take care of them. <laughs> um, Although there is funding in San Francisco to pay for street tree maintenance that is, was funded through Proposition E that was passed a few years ago by the electorate. It was $17 million allocated to Bureau of Urban Forestry to maintain not only the street trees, but the sidewalk around the street trees. However, sidewalk landscaping is not covered by public works and must be covered by the individual homeowner. So for us, that's great because I once I do a project in a school district, it's basically we're married for life and <laughs> like it never ends, the maintenance never ends. But um, with these private properties, we can, you know, I'm happy to come back and, you know, get some landscape money, but that's not what we do. And uh, if they want to hire a contractor to do it for them, they can. Is the homeowner... So we have subsidy. This, for example, is a subsidy grant. Um, by the way, thank you, Karen, for that question. Um, and let's see. Oh, Seuss plant is a giant coreopsis. Thank you, Karen. I love that one. That's one of my faves. Um, so Brent, your question... Um, about the private, you know, we could, I wish that people, and we'll get to this because I paid for my own sidewalk landscape, but um, in general, no, people get subsidies from both the water department, the PUC, Public Utilities Commission, um, because we have a combined sewer in San Francisco. And I would have to look up, I know there are some combined sewers, um, in Southern California, but that is something that I'm happy to look into with you all um, to discuss potential partnership opportunities with your water departments. But for us, the PUC is water, power, and the sewer system. And so the power is not paying for this, the water ain't paying for it, but the sewer department, the sewer division within the PUC has an interest in increasing permeability in the city of San Francisco because of our combined sewer system that the storm drain is connected to the toilets and in the end everything goes to the same place which is the two one of the two wastewater treatment plants. However with increased uh, surges and storms the wastewater treatment plants more and more frequently, unfortunately, are being overwhelmed and they eject human waste and other contaminants into the bay mostly because 80% of the flow goes on the bay side in the Bayview. And then the other 20% is to ocean, um, Oceanside Power Plant, which is down by the zoo, which means on a heavy rain day that those surfers should not be uh, out there because it, we, we're ejecting human waste out there. So here's the, that's the incentive. The incentive is increase permeability and reduce the stress on the combined sewer system. Um, thank you for the, for the props to my artwork. I'm so grateful to be able to, you know, make art and as part of my job, it's, it's lovely, what a privilege. So thank you. Um, 
the water department sounds like in Long Beach is providing native plant kits for parkways. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> they should be doing that. And Long Beach, you know, with all the petroleum coming out of there, they should be doing a lot of that and a lot more. So I'm glad to hear it. So into some more details here, you know, in San Francisco, we actually have a required edging treatment. Um, you know, people like the devil in that details and there is a sidewalk landscape permit fee for public works to come out and inspect the work and ensure that it's ADA compliant. Now people can also, and I've done a few of these, but it is a total headache, <laughs> but we've done um, several driveways um, and here's a buddy of ours. She didn't want the driveway at all. She just wanted her driveway turned into a hangout spot for her and her family. And this is on Quesada Avenue in the Bayview. But in general, this is the required layout of sidewalk landscapes. You have a six foot path of travel in the middle, which is ADA requirement. Although because San Francisco is an old city, um, and there are some, some instances where we can go down to four feet and that's permitted because ADA compliance is a federal law, but it is interpreted locally. We have, this garden shows a property side expansions that happened. And then these are curbside expansions that happened. Um, Brent, you were asking about an L shape. The L shape is in instances where the tree basin is permitted to go all the way to the curb, but sidewalk landscaping, if it's more than 15 feet, must have a courtesy strip of 18 inches from the curb face. And so there's all this fun devil in the details that people hate, <laughs> but there is a reason for it. And um, here's some of our young people interns working. Uh, this was our first year of our internship over at Washington High School, which we called um, the Climate Corps from the river to the sun. And it was a paid internship through the San Francisco Water Department. Um, to uh, ensure that these young people have uh, access to exposure to green type jobs. And so actually this young woman is going to Davis and this young woman I believe is at City College. And so they were great. We had a really small program that year. I think it was three or four. And this year we have 11. And you know, the Richmond District Project was really fun. Here's um, the, the uh, Golden Gate Park in the back there this gentleman is an environmental lawyer and so he and his family and his young boys and lovely family they opted to do a i believe that's a cianothus ray hartman and then um they opted to do 100 percent of what was of what uh public works permitted for removal and that doesn't always happen and so when it does we're really excited because you know, that's gonna be some maintenance for this family, but it's also an opportunity because when you're out there working, you get to meet your neighbors and you get to take a breather and, you know, be outdoors and build habitat right where you live. And so this is my house before I removed my, of course, drive, although I'm cursing my idea now because I have to make a driveway, <laughs> a permeable driveway, but I did, property side and curbside. And in total, it was it is um, 560 square feet removal. I have a mix of some uh, Galvesia speciosa, you know, stuff, the island snapdragon, and I have uh, ribes and Zauschneria epilobium for days. Um, I have that one Mexican palm, which I know she doesn't belong up here, but I really needed it. And I have some other, um, you know, exotic stuff as well. I will share that, you know, we are looking for bigger partnerships with City College. Um, this was going to be a project that we're hopeful can still happen at the multi use building um, at SF City College that will entail um, huge uh, development of gardens. And this partnership is actually with the biology department. And so we're going to not just use California natives in general, it's actually going to be super native SF native plants, mostly sourced from San Bruno um, Mountain. Although, of course, you know, we can get them. I mean, San Bruno Mountain is our native stock here from the peninsula. 
So that is a very exciting project, which, which I'm hopeful will happen, not just because it's $2 million, but because it will be incredible to get our teeth into uh, City College a little bit once things open up again. Uh, this was a project that brought me a lot of joy um, out here in the Lakeside District. I actually moved to South um, Southern San Francisco. <laughs> I lived for 15, 18 years up in, um, you know, Noe Valley Mission, Castro Bernal area. And now I'm down in Ingleside, Lakeside, uh, Ingleside Terrace, down by SF State and City College. This site is a parking lot that um, the planning department, well, actually, the local neighbors um, with the planning department um, worked to um, close it off and turn it into a park, a temporary park, um, uh, but with potential of, you know, completely getting rid of the uh, parking, the pavement. Although I'll tell you, oftentimes these corner lots, and I do want us to actually discuss that, um, especially in SoCal, um, you know, it's important to know that a corner lot in an urban area, if it's capped, probably was a gas station. <laughs> or if it's not probable, it's very possible. So, you know, hazmat issues are important. Um, here's the garden after planting um, with that lovely fog layer that we have. And here's uh, a photo of our five Lionothamnus and I have one California sycamore that went in. We have a bunch of uh, nine bark, which need a little more water than I wanted, but hey, we had them. And so we put them in the ground and they're actually doing really good. You know, we're thinking about permacultural, you know, access and water and everything. They are at the furthest Northern part. We mounded high and created a little shade zone for them. Um, it's been a really fun project that, you know, like I said, we can put these darn trees in ourselves, but it is not about that. It is about empowering young people and people of all ages to participate in the transformation of their community in a positive way. And this project has been just lovely. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions or share more photos with you all and would love to get into some of the details should you have any interest. So, obrigado, xie gracias. And I'm going to turn a light on. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Marcos. That was uh, wonderful work you do. Always great to get uh, people involved. And um, you know, I think um, we need to start one step at a time. Um, and so whatever people could do, as you said, you know, if you could do, you know, small space, big space, you know, whatever you can do is good. So we'll open it up. I think. Um, there's not that many people. So um, if somebody has a question, unmute yourself and, um, and, and speak. Um, ideally, if you could share your screen so we could see who's talking, that, that would be nice, but it's not necessary. I see there's a, uh, in the meantime, I see there's a, uh, besides all the accolades, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, D asked a question. The logs, the use of the logs is edging. You know, we're a climate organization. And I think one of the things that kills me on Sunset Boulevard is, you know, Sunset Boulevard was created, our Sunset Boulevard was created in, in 34, at, which is the same years that the bridges were created. So um, they, <laughs> It was all sand dunes. <laughs> and so the overstory, the canopy now are these giant failing Monterey pine and doing moderately well, some of them Monterey Cypress. Um, and so one of the things that we would actually like to seek funds for, uh, whether it's private or from Cal Fire, I don't know. But um, instead of failing, you know, when the, these trees are senescing, they're getting older and, and moving on. But, you know, uh, public works agencies aren't known for their progressive approaches all the time. And so they just need to get the job done because people complain all the time about any public space. And so that's why the agency has to act that way. So and what we're trying to work with them is instead of felling the tree and chipping it and taking it away, 
if they're going to chip it, leave it for us, but preferably chip the little pieces and leave us the trunk. And so we can dig it in or we can use the wood and actually use it as a carbon sink and build up the organic material in the Sunset District, which is a sandy, sandy, sandy area. So that's one of the things we're working on. And I actually use logs in all of my gardens because it's free. We get it from Arborists. You know, I, I, I implore you all, if you're managing larger spaces to look into partnering with uh, an Arborist and getting access to that type of material, it's a win-win. We as gardeners get the carbon uh, organic matter. Although you certainly don't want one that was growing next to a gas station or, you know, so sometimes the devil is in the details. Um, but, um, and then it's a win for the arborist because the arborist uh, has to pay a fee to landfill it or it gets burned in an incinerator for energy. So. So there's a question in the chat about why you use island natives. Now, I'll, ah, I'll take yeah. that because perhaps the climate in San Francisco is so humid or cool and, and humid, perhaps island natives work well for that. Yeah, exactly. And you know, 2021, we still have a fog layer. It's so great. <laughs> but 2040, 2050, you know, we're going to have Ventura climate in, in that at that time. And so I do work with Southern California plants often. I work with the Torrey pine. We work with uh, Quercus tomentella, which is the island oak, which doesn't thrive, to be honest, in the city. It'd rather be a little um, like maybe in the bay side. Um, but the island, uh, Catalina ironwood, uh, the Coreopsis, which you called, what was that? That was so funny. I have to look at that. plant. After <laughs> plant. And, Yes, Dr. Seuss plant, exactly. Uh, although I would say that could also be the Joshua tree. But, <laughs> um, you know, we work with them, Snapdragon, they just, or the island, uh, you know, Ariaganum, they do super well. Yeah, we have the fog layer here and they do well, they perform well. And although they aren't super native, they um, do provide a significant habitat uh, benefit and they're very climate resilient even with our more extreme heat that we're not as used to here. Island Mallow would be cool. There's the Island Ceanothus that I've never worked with that I really want to. And there also, I do work all the time with Island Cherry, the uh, Prunus alicifolia lyonii. Love that one as well, uh, which I learned from, I actually got my first Lyonii from Luther Burbank's experimental farm because he used the Lyonii to cross with his early cherries back in the turn of the century. Yeah, I don't know of any um, orgs quite like Canon SoCal, but we're ready to start getting down to SoCal. So if y'all are ready for some partnerships, I hope y'all will look me up because we are ready to consult or um, partner and I'm working on expanding and you know, the work is needed uh, throughout the state. And if there's any county that needs more pavement removal, I don't know of any in the country that uh, needs more pavement removal than LA. Um, and so that would be very interesting. I mean, including the whole LA river. I mean, there's a trillion billion dollar project right there. So um, I will say, you know, as you all are doing this type of work, we're happy to consult with you um, or point you in the direction of, you know, I really think for us, what's worked really well is the partnerships, school districts. I mean, they ain't easy partners all the time, but the benefit is real. And um, let's see, this local organization, Native Plant Parkway Gardens. All right, I'm gonna check that one out. Thank you for that. And then, Is soil costly to source with with pavement removal? You have to fill a lot. Um, soil is, you know, if you get good soil, yes, it is expensive. Organic uh, vegetable blend is a minimum ninety eight. I don't know, hundred and some dollars plus a delivery fee per square yard. Landscape soil is cheaper. It's not certified organic. It doesn't matter as much if it's just. Um, perennials, you know, 
Um, and then I would really urge people to stay away from free soil because oftentimes people are pushing soil that um, has contaminants in it. And um, sometimes it doesn't matter. And, you know, and sometimes it does. So the devil's in the details. Um, people up here, we have a, a company called Bayview Green Waste and people go get free mulch from Bayview Green Waste. Oh my gosh, free mulch, yay. No, they chip. Yeah, they get stuff from arborists and they chip up some logs and they chip up branches and leaves and all that, but they also chip up plywood and some construction debris. And, you know, maybe adjacent to a freeway, that doesn't matter so much, but if you're working with young people or elders, it does matter. And exposure to heavy metals and heavy material, you know, toxic material is a, an issue that all of us in urban areas need to focus on. And this state has a lot, a lot of hazmat issues that unfortunately are very common. My own home has over 400 parts per million of lead. Um, there's easy tests you can do at home. All of the all of the work that we do in the school district has to be soil tested. I just spent twelve thousand dollars <laughs> in soil testing at one of our newest projects where we're going to remove fifteen hundred square feet. But you know what? It's worth it because these young people don't deserve to have access to that. And so if a, if there is a higher leaded area, we either have to pay to do abatement or in general, we just don't touch it. Who else might provide plants? I love that Long Beach is providing plants. That's really cool. Um, well, I hope that your CNPS, y'all should be providing some plants for these people. Are you gonna give them any plants? <laughs> Calscape. I admit I'm ignorant on um, nurseries in Southern California. I don't know um, if there is touch use of the logs. Okay, I talked about that. <laughs> Okay, do we partner with schools who reach out to you or contact principals or science teachers? I'll tell you, I've done outreach to schools personally because there's a site that I really like or I li it's in my neighborhood or, but that's, you know, it's kind of like dating where, you know, you're gonna go out after someone and chase them down, but they don't really, ain't really that interested maybe. It's nice to be the one getting chased. Um, and so we are excited that uh, fortunately nowadays that I'm larger now and we've done 19 school SFUSD properties uh, projects, um, you know, huge ones from James Lick to Washington High and all over the place. And so, yeah, it's nice to be procured from the actual community, but I definitely, definitely still do outreach. Um, but like you're saying in there, do we have contact with a science teacher? Absolutely. It depends on the project. Um, sometimes if we're just doing site development work, like our current project at Leonard Flynn, and I can show you in the beginning planning process um, of doing our, my work at Flynn, but we are you know, gonna do another riparian garden. And at that site, I have a better relationship with the PTA than um, with the individual teachers. You know, and sometimes the, the real harsh truth is in these very urban schools, the teachers don't have time to deal with our fun little project or our fun big project because they have other stuff going on. And bless their hearts. And, you know, we want to make it easy for them to engage in the project. So we've actually come to a point now where we're going to be trying to give stipends, you know, a couple hundred bucks or, or something to the lead science teacher who's going to help us, you know, work with the other teachers within the community. Because, you know, being a teacher is really hard and is under remunerated and overworked. And so we want to create solutions for these professionals. Um, now principals, it makes a huge difference if you have a good principal uh, who gets it and who likes what you're doing 
I've, I've been at project like Flynn, uh, excuse me, James Lick, for instance, <laughs> because it's a very um, transient community of professionals, unfortunately, because it's a little challenging uh, school community. You know, middle school sucks anyway, but <laughs> um, so it's, it's a challenging site. We had three principals in three years. First one, I me loved it. Let's do this. Let's do, let's do more. Let's do more. Second one, didn't get it, you know, didn't care. And maybe was overwhelmed with other things going on. And the third one, you know, was really focused on student, student success and didn't quite have the capacity to support us in the ways that we wanted. But, you know, I think the key is to find some good partners in all areas of the school. So admin, PTA, and educators. The kids will come, they love it. You know, however you engage them, they're stoked, they can't wait, whether it's kinder or seniors. So, um, but <laughs> schools are challenging for all the reasons that we know. And, um, but that's part of the fun is, is finding the ways into these, you know, communities. It's a way to educate the population and to create a serious infrastructure within the property. I mean, this isn't gonna go away in a so, few years. It's a so lifelong explain, thing. Yeah, so explain the continuity, like at the school you mentioned, where the principals keep changing, but you have a commitment. Have you signed something with a school or? How does that work? How do you keep the continuity going? Great question. And since we're at 18 sites, um, Rosalie, it is different at every site. I wish I had a memorandum of understanding at all of our sites, but I don't. Um, and some teachers, or rather some principals and admin want that and others want it, but don't know what it is <laughs> and others don't care. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge and it's a yearly thing that, um, you know, I wish that I had more staff that I could allocate to ensuring continuity, but it is a challenge. I'll tell you, and I'm sure you know that environmental education is, or education in general is very challenging to fund. And so while we love our, our environmental education programming, it is not certainly paying the bills. What's paying the bills are larger infrastructure projects. Um, and then maybe we get a little, you know, $5,000 from an individual who lives near the school who wants to see, you know, kids out in the garden. And so that's one of the avenues. Another one of the avenues of funding is the water department. But we also within our school district have a sustainability office and, um, <sighs> It's they've they're you know have their priorities as well, and we have ours, <laughs> and so it doesn't always you know even within the sustainability sector, it doesn't always coalesce either because of money, because of resources, because of time, because of capacity. So yeah, I wish there was a straightforward answer to you, but I will say that. Sometimes I get a, maybe I get a grant that's three years. So I know that I'm good at that site for three years and I can kind of chill. But James Lick, it's hard. It's hard to raise money for that site for the continuity piece. Good question. I wish I had more for you. <laughs> um, are there subsidies you mentioned available in all districts or just the Bayview? Uh, well, it depends on um, the, the current grant that I have to do 15 sidewalk landscapes is actually from the community challenge grant and that is just for the sunset district and part of the community challenge grants that was actually voted on by the voters of San Francisco, I believe in 97, perhaps. And um, basically it's through City Hall that it's a grant program that funds civic and community engagement in public uh, properties. And so to get a free site, free sidewalk landscape with us, you must work, work, 
the free work um, in Sunset Boulevard with us for 10 hours. Or if you don't want to, then you can pay the $26 an hour, <laughs> you know, match times 10, you know. But the point of the CCG, the Community Challenge Grant, is to engage community in their neighborhood and in the embetterment of the community public spaces. But oftentimes, CCG does not pay for these types of projects. It's mostly the Water Department, the Public Utilities Commission. And if any agency has money in SF, it ain't the school district. And it ain't public works. It's the water department, who is actually an enterprise who tax, um, who collects revenue on people paying for their water bill and people paying for their wastewater bill. And they sell the energy made from the hydroelectric power plants as the water goes from Hetch Hetchy in Yosemite, near Yosemite Valley, down from the, the you know, um, Tuolumne River that's dammed. And, you know, that power is sold within the city itself. So the power that the PUC makes is sold to the school district and is sold to the library and is sold to other agencies. And then if there's extra, they sell it to the larger markets. So as an enterprise, they make money and they have a bunch of grant programs, which have, has really helped us. You know, and I, I will say that, you know, these subsidies, they're a part of it, but also these partnerships, you know, like the partnership that we have with Native Plant Society or Burbuena chapter, there's no money exchanged. They provided, I think $7,000 worth of plants. Um, and we had a grant to do the tree piece. So it's not always about subsidies and cash. Sometimes it's about, you know, match dollars of volunteer effort and um, donations as well. But like I said, Sun Sunset District is hard to get partners to want to do removal of pavement. So I'm in the process now of finding those individuals <laughs> to do 1500 square feet. Tony, is there a city program for using recycled water? Recreation and Park Department, um, who manages Golden Gate Park and the other parks within the city. Uh, well, McLaren, when the park was designed, created all these different pools. Uh, pools, I mean, lakes, you know, human-made lakes um, in the dunes. And there is a huge system from the initial engineers, which was Hammond Hall, to do recycled water within Golden Gate Park. Now, since Sunset Boulevard abuts Golden Gate Park, we do get recycled water on 11 of the 38 blocks on Sunset Boulevard. However, the other 30 blocks are using Hetch Hetchy water, which is not ideal. Uh, you really don't wanna be using Hetch Hetchy drinking water to irrigate street trees, <laughs> but, it is what happens. So is there a city program for using recycled water? Yes. However, from what I've heard, we're not as good at it as you are in SoCal. I'm sure partly because of necessity. Um, but as we enter, what, year six of this extreme drought, you know, we really are going to need to come up with some other solutions. Um, and recycled gray water is, is got to be a piece of it. I'll tell you, I applied for five, my biggest grant ever was to <laughs> um, California Natural Resource Agency, and it included $3 million <laughs> worth of uh, purple pipe, which is recycled water irrigation installation. We were not funded for that project. <laughs> um, you know but we are hopeful fingers crossed that maybe we'll hopefully get some of this biden infrastructure money so that is very possible i'll tell you there's a triple whammy and i'm sorry to go off on this a little bit extra but doing work in the sunset district is a triple whammy of improvements for natural resources because if we use recycled water to establish the trees obviously we all know all the habitat value that you know natives and 
trees um, have and can provide, and also blocking the particulate pollution from the 12 lanes of traffic, but also under the Sunset District is the West Side uh, Water Basin, which is actually, you know, we do get our water from Hetch Hetchy. However, 15% of it comes from down um, in the Spring Valley, which is a very old um, 100 plus years uh, addition to San Francisco Water Department. So that's from the peninsula. But as of the last several years, we're actually tapping the aquifer below the Sunset District. So removing pavement, and using recycled water in this neighborhood above that aquifer recharges that aquifer and increases the sustainability and the resilience of our water system within the city of SF, which has a lot of issues. You know, our water travels, we have some of the best water in the state, you know, being the oldest city. Uh, and um, so we have the, you know, we have prim primary rights to that Hetch Hetchy water, which is 150 miles away. But, you know, we're trying to be responsible and we should be, and we should be getting some water from here if we can, and we can if we're tapping from that aquifer, and we are. So at the tune of about 7%. Um, importance of pollinators. Are you focusing on host plants or nectar plants? You know, I would love um, Adela. I would love to uh, learn more about host plants. I focus a lot on nectar plants, personally. Um, but I, you know, in the partnership with Native Plant Society, I'm learning a little bit more about some of the ones. I'll tell you, the thing is, sometimes some of the host plants or some of the natives, as you all know, uh, working with the public. People like it to be pretty and they like it to be showy. I'll tell you also, you guys will appreciate this, but we put a bunch of native plants with the school district on the sidewalk back in 2014 and the head of landscaping with the school district would buzz it down every year. He would be pissed off at it. He would kill all of our native plants in the sidewalk and he'd buzz them down right at the beginning of the school year. Now, the problem with the school year and with native plant cycle is that how do the plants look in August? Yeah, exactly. So they're not on their, their I mean, to us, they're stunning. I mean, at any time, but truth be told to people who don't quite get it yet, it's not what people wanna see from their perspective and certainly from a corporate kind of landscape uh, you know, maintenance standpoint. And, you know, not that they're using that much Roundup, but they do. And it, they like to box hedge stuff. <laughs> I mean, box hedging is Ceanothus, it kills me. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that. So there's a lot of cultural stuff working with the natives um, and finding the right one. So I work with, you know, more about the nectar and kind of resilient showier ones, yarrow, a sticky monkey flower, Grandelia. Um, I love all the other ones, of course, but whether or not they're high performers for the general population, you know, if we have someone who's like all kooky into native plants, then yeah, let's use some fun, you know, <laughs> ugly stuff, ugly stuff that the, the bugs like more than humans do. Two part question from Victoria. Nuts and bolts of installation. What does the, who does the labor? Who do you contract out? How do you go about sourcing your contractors? So, um, yeah, so we, I have used a jackhammer for a few minutes and that was enough because I already, you know, I don't particularly <laughs> want to do that. I definitely contract out the pavement removal piece. We do all the design and the permitting and um, the installation is actually done in community, as I said, I could plant these plants on my own and it'd probably be faster, but that's not what we're about. We're about engaging community. And um, the school district, to be honest with you, uh, no plant goes in the ground unless it's put in by a young person. And so it is important that, you know, um, when we do physical plant, it's not us doing physical plant. We're not that kind of business. We're a, you know, nonprofit education organization. We want to engage people. And the key is to engage young people so that we can cultivate lifelong, you know, proponents of California ecosystems. Um, 
And so that kind of ties into your second part, Victoria, of your um, question, and you can relate to the jackhammer. Uh, cultural competency is super important. And uh, as a white man and a non-native Californian, I'm from Michigan, uh, I've been here 21 years, and we are in Ohlone, Ramaytush, indigenous lands. You know, I think recognition is a super important step. I think also, especially, um, you know, promoting genetic superiority of one plant over another, you know, is really key to make sure you have positive language about it um, that isn't about superiority per se, but about habitat value. Um, so I would say working with multicultural communities is paramount and uh, key to our efforts. You know, working in the public school system, it is a very diverse school system throughout the whole state. Uh, we do provide classes in Espanol and we do signage language in Chinese English or Spanish English. Um, just on Sunset Boulevard, I'm really excited. We're going to do a whole monolingual Chinese campaign for climate education um, that's going to be on the other side of the street of our monolingual English signs. It's the same thing. These trees are capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and with that, we're going to potentially do an Asian grove um, and plant uh asian origin species which i hope you don't all hate me for that um <laughs> but it is one of the ways that we do engage multicultural community and actually um i will love to or my notes went i would love to um learn more about the monarchs in the upcoming event that was discussed earlier because at leonard flynn which is a probably 85 percent latino school we're going to be doing a a pollinator garden of the Americas. And so, yeah, we'll have some natives in it, but we're also going to use a lot of tree daisies and um, other plants that are from Central America, where the majority of the students come from, that are pollinator forage. Certainly, humming, hummers are from, you know, hummers can get um, forage from lots of stuff from Central America. Um, and the tree daisies are nice because they get tall and they can be abused by the school district landscapers and they come back and they also flower in the winter time, which is when the students are there. Um, so all of those things we, we take into account. And you know, also our programming, uh, we want to reflect the communities in which we work. We're gonna start in the next few weeks, our first, um, because I've had high school internships for the last four years. And now we finally have some funding to do college age intern. Well, it doesn't matter what age anybody is, but we're gonna, it's for young or excuse me, it's for uh, people new to horticulture and who are interested in going into the field. And so we're calling it the Biodiverse City Apprenticeship. And um, it's a spring summer apprenticeship out on Sunset Boulevard. And so we're, you know, working with City College, SF State, um, and I do have partnerships, partnerships at USF, but that's not really our target audience for this out, you know, outreach effort. So I think, you know, now I will say also there's challenges that come up with this type of work and, you know, greenwashing and, um, you know, all these issues of, uh, you know, power and class and race and gender and everything needs to be discussed and it's gonna come up and it should, and people should be talking about it. And, you know, at James Lake, we have a Black Lives Matter garden because we wanted to engage that community in the garden. And so we partnered with this young um, African-American girls group called Black, Ma Black Girl Magic, I think it was called. And so they came and planted some plants that were South African um, and other culturally African-American plants like, uh, you know, collard greens, walking kale and stuff like that. So, you know, that's how we do it and other people do it in other ways. And we're always open to learning different ways to engage multicultural community as well. Um, thank you. That was amazing. Um, all those projects sound really cool. And I definitely um, 
look forward to visiting one of your sites next time I'm in the Bay Area. That oh, Asian, um, is, was it Asian uh, Orchard? Well, it's it's in the works, and um, actually one of our partners at Public Works came up with the name of it, Asian Grove. Asian Grove, okay. Well, that's yeah. amazing and delicious. So, um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing, Marcos. Thank you, Victoria, my pleasure. That's gonna be a fun uh, project. Ginkgo's, um, Magnolia Champaca, which is highly revered in Chinese culture. I have, from the Botanical Garden, I have some Himalayan pine and, you know, again, from the habitat perspective, maybe it's not as productive, some of these plant material. I've heard some <laughs> proponents call it, you know, outdoor furniture, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but roads and sidewalks and schools, these are cultural landscapes. And so we need to engage everybody in the state in restoring the landscapes. And if that, you know, if there's certain cultural plants that are gonna bring certain people to the table, that's great. And once we got them over there, we're gonna show them our native, you know, pollinator garden, check this out. And this one's for, and this one's for monarchs. And this one's, you know, this is the pitcher plant or excuse me, the um, pipe vine for the pipe vine swallowtail that we have up here. So, you know, it's what, what is gonna, what's the botanical material or the certain thematic garden that's gonna capture that community. And that's what we, we like we strive to do is get different people involved okay well thank you very much that was a great talk and a lot of uh, wonderful discussion um, brings up a lot of thoughts and a lot of opportunities for people here i'll just uh, add that here um, in our chapter at least we have conti grant money um, so if anybody has a, an idea for a project and you need a little extra money uh, that is a source. You can get information about Conti Grants on our website. Um, I did want to remind people that um, we're going to be having a field trip uh, to um, uh, Willow Springs in Long Beach on June 12th. So um, if anybody's interested, somewhere way back in the, in the chat, um, is the email, but it's membership at sccnps.org. So thanks again, Marcos. Um, it's really cool what you do. And um, I tip my hat to you for um, you know, involving all these young people. Um, as a pediatrician, that's what I do for a living. And I think uh, motivating and heading young people in the right direction is um, one of the main things we can do to improve the, the likelihood that we'll have a planet still. Future. The planet will be fine. Whether or not it can sustain the humans, that's the key. Good point. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. Real pleasure to be Bye. here. And I look forward to hearing more about all, right. all the Bye -bye. great work you're doing in SoCal. Bye.